Hi, right, folks. Uh, yeah, I think this is the last presentation today. <laughs> I hope you already grab your beer outside. <laughs> the party is started. Uh, but actually, yeah, uh, thanks to YouTube, I can still uh, have my talk online. So yeah, perhaps folks can catch up with the talk uh, by YouTube, right? Okay, uh, I'm Charlie Yang, the SDM of OpenSearch Shanghai team. Today, my talk is toward semantic search, what we have now and what will be in the future. <coughs> oh. Yeah, we do have a division in China, uh, about like 20 people. Uh, this is a picture from o uh, AWS Summit uh, happened this June and yeah, we do have a booth there. Uh, actually, uh, Chinese people are also very active in open source. We do have a large community in Shanghai. So I wish could we could have uh, OpenSearch come next year in Shanghai. And uh, welcome to Shanghai. OK, uh, when we talk about RAC, actually, there's a bunch of argue happened early this year about large language model and uh, rack. We say larger and the larger context window is supported by large language model. So people say, okay, let's put everything in the context window and forget about rack. But my attitude is please don't abuse because the number of tokens actually means money, right? Higher inference cost and a higher latency you will lose the trust from your customer. It don't worth it. So if we use a prompt which is super long and with 99% of garbage knowledge and only 1% of ground truth, don't do that. You will confuse the large language model. Even human will be confused, right? So it is proper to have a shorter, uh, sorry, a shorter uh, prompt with proper portion of right knowledge to guide a large language model. So a typical prompt of RAG should be like this. The prompt first portion is opening. Then uh, we will ask a question. The knowledge reference goes the third, and at the last, we will have several example shots telling how the large language model, how to answer the question in the right form, right? And then we will use the question as query to do semantic search over a knowledge base, then give the prompt a right reference about those knowledge. So yeah, actually we are comparing questions with knowledge items using similarity, semantic similarity. And being more generic, we are doing comparison between query, query text and a document, right? And what we are pursuing is two points. One, semantic correctness, which we all say accuracy. Second thing is efficiency because People usually don't want to wait for too long. Okay? Then let's go back to the age when there was only lexical search. At that time, keyword based matching will suffer from vocabulary mismatch. Here is an example. What is the climate of Big Apple in 1970s? And actually, there is a document. According to the study, the weather in NYC is stable in 1970s, and the temperature is climbing up year by year. Actually, it's a quite good uh, positive example, right? But because climate cannot be matched with weather, and Big Apple cannot, actually it's New York City, but NYC is also another name of uh, New York City, but they are not connected together. And actually, temperature and climate, although they are different concepts, but they have some kind of connections. And we miss them all, so this will be considered as a not match when we use keyword-based matching. So at that time, huge company with bigger money, they will hire 
huge relevance teams maintaining by human those synonymous dictionaries from different perspectives. And actually, they need to work super hard to catch up with the latest lingo change because it's the age of internet. New words, new expressions will happen. OK, so after almost like uh, 20 and 9, uh, learning to rank is happening because the people find the CTR data is super useful. They are collecting the click events from the user behavior. Yeah, so we can build uh, some complex model based on different pattern matching based rules. Like we have six rules together, and we can blend them using a ranking model and using, sorry, using the CTR data as a training, the training data for a ranking model. Then it's how it works. Uh, still huge uh, manually uh, relevance, uh, sorry, uh, manually uh, pattern match based uh, uh, team were doing digging those patterns. And uh, yeah, uh, machine learning uh, system was working to optimize the uh, ranking model at that time. And after 2018, I think uh, the age of text embedding is coming with the born of BERT model. Everything can be embedded into a vector. This is good news, so uh, images, videos, music, and especially text can be embedded into a vector uh, typically like 512 or 768. Uh, this is a vector. And uh, the similarity, semantic similarity between two things, actually why I said two things, is because they can either be image or they can either be text, can be compared using the similarity of two vectors. And thus is purely a math problem, right? We can use L2 distance, dot product, and cosine similarity to do that. So a very uh, abstract, or we say a very uh, high level semantic problem can be transformed into a math comparison. It is easy. So thanks to graph-based uh, algorithms, we can first locate some examples into a graph and search over its neighborhood. That is actually uh, HMSW, right? Hierarchical navigatable small world. Then we can search over a large vector base using the accelerated KNN algorithm, and the KNN become ANN, which A is approximate. So it was already available since OpenSearch is still called OpenDistro. That's a very old time. Now OpenSearch is trying to make it even more out of box, which means we are not positioning ourselves as a pure vector DB, but a total solution for semantic search. It's out of box. So we have two uh, modules here. First is ML Commons. ML Commons is a fundamental tool to let OpenSearch host machine learning models. And with, at this moment, with connectors, we can connect OpenSearch with models hosted on SageMaker, Bedrock, even OpenAI, Cohere, Anthropic, everywhere. If you have an endpoint of the model, then you can serve that inside OpenSearch. And for new research, actually, it provides two functionalities. First is the ingest the processor, embed the fields into vectors because you want to search it with semantic search, right? And also a DSL query, which you can embed the query text that before it was searched by the KNN algorithm. So the pipeline is like this, but with new research, it is end to end. So you only just write a DSL query, then you can have it query by text and the result in text. But everything in the middle was handled by OpenSearch. This is we call out of box. 
Even more, you know, from a scientific view, we also needed to make those models out of books. It is called zero shot retrieval. We have a bunch of scientists in OpenSearch working on bring you a zero shot retrieval. And what is zero shot retrieval? Actually, I will have a history listen to you. Uh, yeah, before 2018, which where a uh, BERT model is born, most of the text retrieval model should be built based on customer data. So it's a very, very expensive way to have a strong labeler team and also a strong product. People will usually offer click-through data to train your retrieval model. And after 2018, we have BERT, we have transformers. Then people can use the foundation models to start and collect those feedback data or labeling by human to fine tuning this uh, foundation model into a customer adapted model. And now our target is, okay, this is a still very heavy uh, pipeline that people should uh, invest a lot on the human work. And now our target is, it's a called zero shot model which means it is pre-trained model, yes, but it can be ad uh, adopted to multiple uh, domains. So you just use this model in your product and it is okay, there's no fine tuning, no human labor invested. We have plenty of pre-trained model on our website. You can just scan the QR code, save it to your uh, album and uh, use it later. Okay, then we kept receiving complaints about how it, after we adopt new research, it was hard to tune KN index in order to meet the production's requirement. In fact, tuning OpenSearch KNN is actually a trade-off. There are multiple parameters in HNSW and also IVF. We have some uh, parameter which is relatively to accuracy, but uh, the side effect is it will boom the index size. We also have some uh, parameters, yeah. We can help with uh, accuracy, but it will bring higher latency. And also like end list with higher value, higher accuracy, and higher RAM usage. So yeah, with the rooftop on your uh, product requirement, you should maximize the combination of those parameters. Oh, it's a very, very uh, difficult job for people to tune like this. Uh, overall, yeah, IVF consumes much, much less storage and give you much, much less latency, but uh, much, much worse on accuracy. So let's be brave. How can we have some all? Yeah, I know people will think I'm bringing a new algorithm. Yeah, I'm bringing in a new algorithm, but I'm not saying that KNN is out of date. People can still have their own philosophy because maybe there will be great potential to have KNN to be more compact, and also there will be more development on the accuracy of dense encoding. But actually still, uh, our product will actually uh, act as a first trial on how to solve these problems, a bunch of problems together. So we bring you Neuros Bus. Actually, Neuros Bus is a new algorithm which do not depend on KN, and it has three types of feature. First is, we are offering self-tuned models, which is already uh, state-of-the-art on Harking Face. Yeah, there's pl plenty of downloads last week, uh, but it's still the uh, state-of-the-art on uh, sparse information retrieval. We hope in the future we can get climb to the peak that it, it is uh, the information retrieval state-of-the-art. That would be better. And uh, with the sparse present, uh, representation, uh, it will have compact storage and it will save you money. 
And also with our inference-free mode, we will have super low latency, uh, which meets your product requirement on a rapid response end-to-end. -end. Let's see how new response works. So for dense encoding, actually, we are using a language model to transform the text document into a dense vector, as I have mentioned. And it will be uh, indexed using the HNSW. And let's think about a new way that we are encoding using large language model for the doc into a new form, which is the sparse vector. So yeah. I think uh, over like 70 or even 80% of those entries are zero. Others are non-zero. So actually, we can represent that into a JSON format like this, right? And it's quite familiar. This is actually the term vector for Lucene. So we are indexing those documents still using Lucene and by the encoding of the term vector. So you can also consider that our model actually acts as an analyzer, open search analyzer, right? To convert the document into a term vector. So that's actually what we were doing. So let's recall also the, how it works from a more science view. This is a document. And actually, our model were extracting those very important words, or we say tokens. Yeah, but because BERT model is using word piece tokenizer. It's actually a token. It's not the uh, uh, whole world. It's some character from one world. So those important tokens were extracted and gathered together. Yeah. And this is a very raw representation of that document. And also, our model will give them weight. But after that, the model will spread the weight into some tokens which does not exist in the original document. We say this is somehow like imagination, like the misty word misty, right? And the token mist have some close meaning tokens like haze and fog. These are actually synonyms. But we are expecting more that actually the large language model is playing with magic, playing with some uh, other uh, low frequency uh, tokens used then to represent actually high level semantics. Yeah, it is interesting, but there's few works dive into those phenomena that uh, are they actually doing synonym uh, imagination, or it will have embed some kind of high-level semantics into those words that does not exist in the document. It's quite interesting. We hope there will be some uh, paper. Actually, my team is also doing the research on this. So it brings you a very compact representation not so compact because it has uh, imaginations, right? But actually, it's semantic. So we are also studying the relevance uh, stability for the dense and sparse uh, encoding. So we s when we say dense vectors, actually, when the model is facing familiar corpus, which means it's quite uh, of uh, same or we say similar to those corpus where the model is trained on. And the search relevance is high because it can give you a very precise vector. But the bad case is the model will hallucinate when the corpus is unfamiliar. Then it will give you an un uh, unpredictable vector. And the search relevance will suddenly go low when it was facing unfamiliar corpus. And uh, the interesting thing is the, the situation is quite uh, similar when uh, working with familiar corpus for sparse model. right? The imagination, or we say the expansion, is reasonable. So the search relevance will still be high. But when the model is facing unfamiliar corpus, things go interesting. 
because it will be very conservative. Uh, it will not likely to expand. It's just to use those tokens in the document. And then it degenerates itself into a keyword-based match. It's actually BM25. So the search relevance will be robust, not being impacted by those unfamiliar corpus. So we are also looking into a very interesting topic that how can we make it even faster because we are using Lucene is faster and how can we make it even faster? Yeah, we deprecate the online inference part. Let's recall the similar, similarity comparison between the query and the document. Actually, they all go sparse encoder and embed them into two different uh, sparse vector. Actually, for sparse vector, we also use dot product, dot product simi similarity between them, right? But for query, we think it is quite short and simple. So we are not using transformers. We just tokenize them. Then we don't need any GPU online, and it's inference free. So we don't need GPU, and because we don't expand the queries, so the, the search space will be relatively smaller, and it will be fast. And actually, in our real experiment, we will find that it only drops 3% on NDCG. It's still tolerable. And people will ask a question, very sharp question, that because only 3% of NDCG is dropped, and you are m removing query encoding, it's just the segmentation, right? So does that mean semantic search means nothing? Uh, I would like to announce here that no. Because we are having lots of optimization on the relevance to catch up the performance. So yeah, we are doing a lot of optimization to the document encoding side to catch up with the performance. The most typical thing is called the heterogeneous knowledge distillation assembling. Yeah, this is what actually we do in our first version we call the uh, neural sparse V1. Actually, we do some kind of fine tuning after the pre-training phase, or we say we just use a pre-trained uh, BERT model and do fine tuning. It is based on a smaller but well prepared data set. Actually, the ground truth is relevant Q and A pairs are selected as positive examples, and irrelevant Q and A pairs are selected as negative examples. But actually, uh, in that data set, uh, the quantity of these ground truths is still very small, where we just adopt a teacher, which is large language model, to dig more pairs and give the pr prediction of relevance. So actually, uh, this teacher is called cross encoder. And cross encoder is somehow like uh, we have a very heavy uh, inference cost, but give you a very precise prediction of relevance, and the manner is they will not search uh, the database. You give them a, a document and give them a query, and it will tell you the relevance, something like that. And after that, we find a bottleneck using fine tuning. So we draws back. We add a pre-training phase before the fine tuning. So we with a pre-trained model, we do the second phase pre-training using a massive and a raw data set. Where the training data here, we randomly example some uh, sentence and passage pairs and uh, using three different teachers to evaluate their, uh, to evaluate their uh, similarity. But the problem is, although they are randomly exampled, we should conduct a uh, search phase over the massive data set because the size is super large. So we need to index uh, those items first and uh, to retrieve. So those teachers are not large language models. Those teachers should be uh, encoding models, or we say uh, text embedding models, 
right? So we use using task B, which is BERT sentence transformer model, and BGE, which is uh, a SOTA model uh, in the BR benchmark. Yeah, but we are using some version of them because not all the BGE versions are zero shot. And uh, uh, the teacher model also, we are using the by encoder model, which is uh, in our V1 uh, neural sparse model. This is uh, a version of using online, uh, or we say search online inference part. And with these three teachers, we are assembling them together to you know, extract their knowledge to guide the pre-training phase. And we go back to the fine tuning phase. Actually, it works. So let's look into some benchmark of our performance on BIR dataset. BIR dataset is, <laughs> its full name is really interesting. It's just a benchmark of information retrieval. And actually it consists of like almost 20 datasets we can evaluate our method on. And it's used for zero shot uh, information retrieval, which means only the model can only be allowed to train on MS Marco dataset, not the BER dataset. And then uh, all the uh, datasets in BER will be used to evaluate that model. So it's uh, quite fair, we say, uh, somehow like double blind evaluation because the, the model cannot touch the knowledge inside of those data sets. And okay, actually you can see task B, which outperforms a lot of model on MAS Marco data set, but it cannot even beat BM25 on BEIR because it's zero shot. But you can see our V1 model reached a very high score at that like 0 0.49. And even better, our sparse V2 model can be 0 0.5. Yeah, actually uh, on those uh, Contriver and Cobert, which is widely used in the productions nowadays, they cannot beat our, mo even beat our inference free model. And our non-inference free model, which means we also use a model to encode our uh, queries, they are even, even better. So for sparse retrieval, now they are somehow like a uh, uh, state of the art uh, on the BEIR model. I'm not sure whether we are the state of, state of the art for zero shot retrieval, because actually now the state of the art on BEIR is a Mistral model. It is a large language model, and the performance is like 0 0.554, 0 0.554 just you know, a little ahead of our sparse V2 model. And uh, sadly, even that uh, Mistral large language model was fine-tuned on BIR dataset itself. So it's not a zero shot. And we can also say that the V2 sparse model, we are even using a smaller uh, backbone and it have higher relevance than V1. So it will be a quite a economic model and high performance model to all of our customers. The second benchmark is about the index size. You can see that BM25, yeah, yeah we are having a data set of MS Marco, which is 8.8 .8 million uh, documents. And for BM25, we have one GB in excess, but for KN, it's 55.4 GB for the index size. But I think uh, people will always know that the uh, king is much, much larger. But for our index size, we have 6.8 GB if we use inference free. And if we don't use inference free, it's 4.7. Because for inference free model, we will have more expansion on the document side in order to catch a high performance because we don't encode the, the, the query, right? So it's relatively larger, but it's still just 6.8, which is only 10% uh, of uh, KN size. And after some other uh, optimization we are going to conduct in 2025, it will uh, most likely to, to be one GB in the future. 
So it's 100% aligned with BM25. So the benchmark three is actually we are comparing the speed with BM25 and also uh, dense retrieval. For I think for dense retrieval, it will go to almost one second. Uh, we are not using a uh, concurrent search. So for concurrent uh, uh, KN search, you can see sometimes the latency could be around like 20 milliseconds, but actually we are using non-concurrent search. So yeah, the numbers are relatively higher. And on these five data sets on BIR, we can see the, the black ones are uh, actually without two-phase acceleration algorithm. Uh, we are almost like uh, two to five times than uh, BM25. But when we use two-phase acceleration, there are things like we are almost aligned we are, uh, with BM25, and on some data set, we are even faster. So which means even the speed, we can align with BM25. Another advantage for uh, Neurospass is filter friendly. So let's recall the searching process of HNSW, right? Each time we have a seed uh, list and we f find uh, the candidate over their neighborhood in the graph, and we will have a next round of candidates, right? And there were three types of filtering uh, for HNSW. First is pre-filtering. Uh, pre Actually, if we use pre-filtering, then the KN search will be conducted on the filtered data set, and we can only use brute force scanning. Uh, HNSW is not uh, eligible. And the most, in most of the cases, we will use post-filtering, which means we will have a larger K to allocate some buffer, for example, loss. And we will first conduct ANN, then uh, use a post-filtering post scheme to leave out those uh, examples after. And also, uh, open search support runtime filtering, which means we will have it applied in each iteration, like this. So after each round, we will have our filters happen before it goes to the candidate list. But it will have a problem that uh, in each round, if the recall is bad, then it will take far more iterations to get enough examples to meet the K. So we cannot guarantee the latency. But let's wait for high cardinality filters in 2025, which is already on the roadmap of KN. It will solve this problem. But before that, we can enjoy new response. Because neural bus is actually BM25 queries. So yeah, the filter can be conducted together with the uh, search query. It's just one round. So uh, actually, the speed is very fast. Let's try it on uh, AWS. Also, we, we have a demo on uh, YouTube. You can see how easy we uh, deploy a model and use that using neural bus. So let's look uh, into a very interesting uh, scenario for neural bus. Actually, uh, the OpenSearch Shanghai team is deeply collaborated with Shanghai AI Lab AWS. So they are offering a solution of multimodal neural bus. Let's also recall the dot product uh, formula here. And what actually they do is to substitute the document into an image. So the sparse encoder can not only support documents, but also support images. And this we call the multimodal sparse encoder. And the interesting thing is we can also make it inference-free. So it will be inference-free uh, text-to-image search, right? OK, uh, these are actually neural sparse blocks we have. Uh, we can see the main blocks and also other optimizations we take into that model. Let's think about more scenarios after neural sparse. You know, let's recall the prompt of RAG, actually. 
What if people are asking questions about data insights instead of knowledges? So we are not searching over a uh, knowledge base. Actually, we should s giving uh, supporting data evidence. So that will be more interested if we, uh, we are not searching unstructured data, and we are searching structured data. So what actually we are proposing is to transform the question into a real query, which is data analytics query instead of uh, unstructured uh, semantic query, right? And uh, after the execution in AOS, or we say uh, execution uh, open search, yeah, then we will give the data. These data are acting as supporting data evidence to answer the question people will give you. So this is what we call data analysis rag. So we are picking a most suitable data analytics language for log and, uh, for open search. So we are picking PPL, uh, pipeline processing language. I think uh, there's a bunch of topics uh, happening in the daytime, right? So yeah, it uh, will help you finding the search log patterns or the data stored in like S3, open search, premises, data lake, everywhere. Yeah. And uh, now it is, I think, uh, the best language uh, open search. Actually, uh, AWS will promote for data analytics, log, log analytics, all kinds of scenarios uh, where we use. So yeah, this is an uh, example that uh, uh, what a PPL looks like. Uh, I think it's somehow you can see uh, we're familiar, but uh, much better than uh, much much better than SQL, right? So it is uh, each command is piped together. Use that pipe punctuation. So each step will uh, based on the outcome of last step. But we were still uh, having some kind of SQL-like syntax, like uh, uh, doing statistic by, right? And we can easily get uh, the top five results using a head command. So every command is piped together here. So actually, what we are doing is we want to have large language model to write PPL for us. And hereby, we have two observations. First is mainstream large language model are not pre-trained on PPL language because the knowledge is limited. Yeah, that's the truth because uh, PPL is a very young language and the large language model don't know that. But what if we do in-context learning, which means we put all the PPL tutorial in the prompt? It's a super large prompt and it's not a compact and the large language model will say why it is so large. So actually we can write a guideline of programming on the syntax, but we cannot give all the function specs in the prompt. It's super, super large and the latency, we cannot tolerate it. So our solution is let's go and train one large language model. So we pick up the large language, vanilla language model, we say a raw large language model, the backbone is Mistral model. And this is actually a very typical training pipeline of large language models. We will first do continu continual pre-train and then do uh, supervise the fine tuning. On the pre-train phase, we will feed the large language model with open search documents, PPL documents, function specs, and also PPL examples. And after the pre-train phase, we will do fine tuning phase. Uh, the, actually, the training data is question to PPL pairs. But the problem is if we build the question PPL pairs data set, Definitely, we are not able to manually write the question PPL pairs at a, such a large scale. So let's go mimic then. Yeah, we are actually using the output of another foundation model. But just consult your legal if you want to reproduce this process, because not all the large language models allow you to use their output, right? 
you will be in trouble. And actually, uh, Amazon is getting the warranty of Anthropic, so we can use them. And now, if you want to reproduce in the open search way, uh, you can refer to Llama 3. Actually, Llama 3 is a free license you can use their output. Then uh, with this foundation model, and uh, we having a prompt. Uh, with opening, then we give a very short PPL tutorial, <laughs> because the tutorial is super long, and some programming tips. And with some human, human wrote examples to guide the, the large language model to write those pairs and say, please generate the data set for me. And we will have a raw data set. Then we will do some uh, sandbox execution filter, which means we will run the PPL on a text open search cluster to filter out those field cases. And because those cases are generated by the large language model, and we don't have the ground truth execution result, so we will ask the large language model to reflect on um, its self-generated uh, uh, PPL, asking the question, am I right? So it will give you a uh, regression result to filter out those failure cases. And there's also one thing on the roadmap in the future is we will do cross-validation, which means we find that most of the large language models are really good at writing Python. So why don't we have them write in Python and uh, give you the result, and we will compare the result with PPL to see whether it is uh, robust or not. So here is an execution example that how many requests there were last week in each response code. And it will give you a very simple PPL. You can see the filter uh, condition is within a time range, and uh, yeah, uh, now and uh, interval one week. Then it is a uh, time range, and all the log will go through this time range and uh, count by response code as a histogram. And uh, after executed, it is a uh, histogram illustrated in the dashboard, OK? Yeah, and uh, you can uh, have it on AWS. Actually, uh, we are trying to open source the model, have an open source version model uh, public uh, maybe uh, in 2025, maybe, yeah. And uh, now you can only uh, experience it on our managed service. OK, what a semantic search will be in the future is likely with the target of cost reduction. Uh, the new ARAS BM25 will born, and it, it definitely be semantic, which means uh, maybe new response, maybe other algorithms, yeah, the cost will be aligned with BM25, and it is semantic search. This is one of our targets. And the second thing is, yeah, we are thinking next generation of search. It's not just to, to paste you the most relevant documents. It's silly. Right, it, it should be trying to solve your problem. So beyond the relevance matching, the search engine will sync from a higher level toward the de delivery. It will sync for you, give you the solution. Maybe it's a suggestion, maybe it's an answer, or maybe it's just a, a pipeline of problem solving. Yeah. So yeah, this is something about myself. And since we are uh, already going over time, so you can grab me uh, in this place whenever you have questions. Thank you.